Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 9213 in the name of Jenny Go Ruth on Let's Talk Education, the national discussion. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Jenny Go Ruth to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, for around 13 minutes, please. Presiding officer, I am pleased to bring forward a debate this afternoon during Scottish Government time on our national discussion on education. It was Professor Ken Muir's review, Putting Learners at the Centre, which provided the rationale for the discussion and the recommendation for a national discussion on establishing a compelling and consensual vision for the future of Scottish education. It is this vision that I present to Parliament today. I am keen, in the spirit of last week's debate, to engage with the opposition consensually as we move the education reform agenda forward and to listen to any ideas that they may have to support the government and, ultimately, Scotland's children and young people in that endeavour. Presiding officer, this morning I visited Turbank Primary School in Portobello to officially launch the vision with some of the young people who took part in the national discussion. Turbank Primary have an impressive pupil parliament and I am quite sure we may yet see some of those representatives in this place in the future. My thanks go to the head teacher, Mr Friend, for his time and my apologies to my friend, Ms Gladson, whose primary three class I interrupted. For our older pupils and anxious mums, dads and carers, today is also an important day in the Scottish education calendar. Today marks the last day of the official exam diet. So I'd like to congratulate pupils and learners across Scotland for all their hard work. Today will be a day of reflection for many, so it's timely that we reflect on the future of Scottish education. Back in Happy to do so. Willie Rennie. Um, I, I want to, to thank the Minister for our open uh, door approach so far to, to our new position. Um, I think she will have seen in the national discussion report that additional support needs get quite a showing. And in fact, the report refers to a flashpoint whenever this issue is discussed, particularly with parents. Has she reflected on that? And what is her view about how we can tackle these long-standing problems? Cabinet Secretary, I can give you the time back. I thank the member for his point. I'll come on to talk about the challenge presented uh, in the report in relation to the issue he has addressed. He will also be uh, well-versed in relation to the increase we've seen in additional support needs pupils in the course of the last 10 years. I think it's increased, and we now have just over a third of all pupils in Scotland with some level of identified additional support need. I think there is more that government will need to do, but I also recognise this is about partnerships ultimately. It's about local authorities and wider partnerships too within school communities. I'm going to come on to talk about that in my response today, but today is not the government's fulsome response to the report. You'll understand, of course, I think as we've heard, it's been embargoed until 10 to 3 today. More broadly, though, to the member's point, I think the report doesn't sit in isolation. We also have the Hayward review into the qualifications um, in the senior phase. We also have, of course, the Withers review in relation to our skills delivery. I think we need to have a holistic and coherent approach across government in relation to the future of Scottish education, and I want to say some more about that in my uh, remarks today. So, back in 2002, presiding officer, when I was in my last year at school, the then Scottish executive launched a, a national debate on schools for the 21st century. That debate generated over 1,500 responses, and it was estimated that over 20,000 people took part. 21 years later, the national discussion reached an estimated 38,000 people with over 5,600 responses. And I am indebted to Professor Carol Campbell and Professor Alma Harris, both internationally respected education experts and members of our International Council of Education Advisors, the national discussion facilitators. Today, I thank them personally for their commitment and dedication. And I would also like to pay tribute to every person and organisation who took part in the discussion. Now, the national discussion is the biggest engagement exercise ever to have taken place in Scottish education. It was co-convened by the government and by COSLA, and I think there can be no doubt that the discussion had children and young people at its heart, and that, in general, it was consensual. There were a number of events and discussions that took place in every part of Scotland. Those were led by schools, community groups and third sector organisations supported by the Scottish Government and local authorities. We heard from parents, primary school pupils, island communities, young carers, children with additional support needs, as we've heard, teachers, trade unions, early years practitioners, speakers of Gaelic and Scots, to name just some. Time and again, the facilitators were told by participants that they welcomed the opportunity to give their views and they wanted more opportunities for engagement. So I commit today to ensuring that that engagement opportunity continues throughout our education reform programme. We have to get this right for the next generation, and we can't do that without continuing to listen. The agreed vision presiding officer states that children and young people are at the heart of education in Scotland. 
The Scottish education system is grounded in collaborative partnerships that engage all learners, the people who work within and with the education system, parents and carers, to ensure that all learners in Scotland matter. All learners are supported in inclusive learning environments which are safe, welcoming, caring and proactively address any barriers to learning and inequities that exist or arise. Education in Scotland nurtures the unique talents of all learners, ensuring their achievement, progress and well-being. Each child and young person in Scotland has high-quality learning experiences which respect their rights and re represents the diversity of who they are one minute, and the communities they live in. Each child and young person receives great teaching, resources and support for joyful learning that builds their confidence and equips them to be successful and to contribute in their life, work and world so they know how much they matter. Happy to give way to the member. Stephen Kerr. I'm not sure if she's just read a statement of her objectives or whether she's trying to reflect the reality. I hope it's, I hope it's the former and not the latter, because what this report illustrates throughout it and in every aspect of this report, there is frustration, there is unhappiness, there is a desire for improvement. And I hope that Jenny Ruth, as the incoming Cabinet Secretary, will be someone who will bring a breath of fresh air, that she will address the issues that are raised in this report with the honesty and integrity that I think I expect of her and others expect of her. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, heaven forbid I don't live up to your expectations, Mr Kerr. Um, but in, in seriousness, uh, the vision that I address to Parliament is the vision from the, the document itself. So it's the vision from the document. Yes. And it is for government to respond to that vision, I think, as I alluded to in my response to, to Mr Rennie. And given that members have only had the report, of course, since Thursday of last week, and it's been embargoed until 10 to 3, the member will understand that the government will need to take time to respond to the report. But I intend to do so in a fulsome manner, but one which also respects and acknowledges the plethora of other reports that are ongoing at the current time in Scottish education. I think we need that holistic approach as we move forward. Presiding officer, I'm very mindful, uh, as I've just outlined to Mr Kerr, the opposition uh, have not perhaps yet had time to fully digest what is a very substantive report. And equally, as I mentioned to Mr Kerr, I'm not going to stand here today and give members answers to all of the issues that are raised in the national discussion. It is right that government takes time to consider our response. And I do need to reflect that this report takes place in that broader uh, review format in relation to the other ongoing matters in Scottish education at the current time. But happy to do so. Pam Duncan Glancy. The Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. I've just left a round table on children with additional support needs and one of the comments that was made was that the only certain thing in education um, is, is reform. So can, can the Cabinet Secretary guarantee that another certainty from this report will be action from the government? I'm happy to give uh, Pam Duncan Glancy that absolute reassurance today. I think we need to move forward at pace in relation to reform, but we also need to make sure that we continue to engage with the profession, and uh, I think that's hugely important in relation to where we will get on reform. We need to take teachers and those who work in our education sector with us, and fundamentally our children and young people. Now, I do want to touch on a number of the important findings that were captured uh, in the national discussion. The first relates to joy, uh, perhaps not a word we hear often in the chamber, but the simple proposition being that learning should be joyful. And the discussion goes on to talk about uh, professionals who spoke of instilling the joy and igniting the love of learning and their appreciation about the opportunity to talk about that with each other. Teaching can be joyful, presiding officer, and I think we need to reflect, yes, in government, but actually through other organisations, as I think uh, Pam Duncan Glancy alluded to in relation to reform, be that local councils or those education bodies, how can we better empower the profession to create space so that they can enjoy what they do best? Now, my modern studies teacher at school used to call it the light bulb moment, that exact moment when you realise you've taught a child a concept and that they have understood it. There is no feeling like it, because fundamentally we want people who teach our children and young people to love what they do, to have a passion for it. And the report talks about the respect that exists for a graduate level teaching profession, talking uh, later actually about a human centred educational improvement, which places people who work in education, especially those such as teachers who are directly responsible for teaching and supporting children and young people, at the centre of informing and leading educational improvement. And I think this also speaks to the Conservative Amendment, which talks about empowering the profession to be more autonomous. And I agree with that sentiment. I want to work with our teaching professional associations and how that can be better supported as we move forward with reform. As I think I mentioned uh, previously, the context of the national discussion is also important in relation to the other reports that have been commissioned by the government and that will publish in the coming weeks. But it's also important to reflect the global context, which the report notes, and that uh, talks to the challenges in relation to austerity, the cost of living crisis, climate change and a war in our world, which the report notes cannot be downplayed. And, presiding officer, we discussed in last week's debate the anxiety experienced by young people during lockdown 
and the associated impacts on their mental health. But our schools are not hospitals for all ailments. They cannot respond independently without partnerships and without experts who can help. So the discussion talks about networks and collaborations with a range of communities. Visit any school in Scotland, you'll see that collaboration in practice, whether it's social work, the local Rotary Club, DYW, active schools, or even Scottish Opera, as I was hearing at Tower Bank Primary earlier today. And indeed, as the professors recognise, reform isn't just about change for change's sake. There is a lot to be proud of in Scottish education, so much that we can build on. The support, for example, is, report rather, is supportive of Curriculum for Excellence's focus on numeracy and literacy. It recognises the commitment to equity and inclusion, to a broad-based curriculum, to tackling the poverty-related attainment gap, to well-being and support for a highly skilled teaching qualification. But there was also recognition that more needs to be done to ensure continuous improvement. Respondents to the discussion also raised the need for every child to be educated in a safe, inclusive environment, which respects relationships where effective anti-bullying strategies are in place. Now, I think, as I set out in the debate uh, last week, we have a level of challenge here at the current time in relation to the thematic inspection, which was carried out by Education Scotland some time ago now, because we know that only a, a third of schools, for example, don't use CMIS to record bullying incidents. Now, I've discussed this matter with COSA directly to ensure we have more consistency as we move forward. The facilitators, though, also heard about levels of children and young people with additional support needs, as we've heard from Mr Rennie, and as I'm sure we'll hear this afternoon. And um, I think it's really important that we do take this away as a strong action point from the report and we seek to embed that in the reform agenda as we move forward. I don't think, presiding officer, we can walk away from the presumption of mainstreaming. That's a hallmark of the inclusive education system that we have in Scotland. But we do have a responsibility to ensure the system for young people that's put in place allows them to flourish in the mainstream environment. Too often, we all know of examples where this has not been the case, and it shouldn't be for parents or carers to have to fight for that entitlement. Presiding officer, there's a strong theme in the report around skills-based and practical learning, around learning for life, and around ensuring skills-based learning and qualifications are given parity of esteem with academic qualifications. There was also a focus on the need for inclusivity and diversity to be embedded at all levels. Like any curriculum, of course, Scotland's Curriculum for Excellence needs checks and balances to be in place to ensure it continues to be relevant. Further, to meet the needs of our children and young people, uh, to ensure those that are working in our schools are supported to deliver the curriculum uh, successfully. So it's absolutely right that we continually, uh, continually look to evolve the current curriculum delivery model and we equip our learners for the challenges they will face in the future. Presiding officer, uh, the vision itself, I think, is the starting point as we look to the future. The challenge for all of us in Scottish education now is to work together to make this vision a reality. The call to action that has been developed by the facilitators drawing on the national discussion sets out the principles from which we can build actions to make the improvements we need to see in Scottish education. And as intimated earlier today, a number of independent reports exploring specific aspects of our education system are due to report in the near future. I will be considering the outputs of the national discussion alongside those reports. It's right we take time to reflect and I will provide a detailed response to uh, the national discussion in the autumn. The reform of our education system, as I mentioned, is quite rightly ambitious and it is um, ambitious for our, our young people, but it also needs to be pursued at pace. I recognise some of the challenges that the pandemic has presented the education system with. I think our reform agenda is ambitious, but we need to take teachers with us. We need to take those who work in our schools with us. We need to take our young people with us. I look forward to working with my local government partners and everyone with an interest in Scottish education to make the vision of the national discussion a reality. And I call on the Chamber today to welcome the publication of the discussion, endorse the vision and work with the Scottish Government and COSLA to turn this vision into a reality. There is an optimism for the future of Scottish education and, as the facilitators note, an enthusiasm to be part of taking the outcomes of the national discussion forward. And there's also an overwhelming appetite for change in Scottish education. So let's not miss this opportunity and commit today to make that optimism a reality to ensure that we deliver that vision for Scottish education that ensures that all learners matter. Presiding officer. Could you, you move the motion, please? Cabinet, you need to move the motion. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Stephen Kerr to speak to a move amendment at 9213.3, around nine minutes. Mr Kerr. And I move the amendment in my name. Um, as I tried to intervene on the Cabinet Secretary to say... It's important that we have an honest discussion about where we are in Scotland with Scotland's education system. And the SNP really shouldn't try to disguise their positive of positive ideas or policies by trying to hide behind 
the national discussion. Because we can all very clearly see that Hamza Yusuf and his ministers are scratching around for policy ideas. Just look at last week. I thank goodness the Scottish Conservatives had ideas about tackling violence in schools. The government could then copy and paste the Scottish Conservative motion with minor adjustments and present it as their initiative. And I'm not moaning about it. I wish they'd do it more often. Now, I'm happy to give way to the Cabinet Secretary if she will just update us on when the summit that she proposed is going to take place. Oh. Cabinet Secretary. The discussion didn't come about in relation to the current First Minister. This has been commissioned as a result of the Muir report. It feels to me that the member may have come with a pre-prepared script to the Chamber today and perhaps has not actually engaged in reading the report itself. Um, I would certainly encourage him to do so. It is a substantive body of work. I already gave an undertaking last week during what was a consensual debate in relation to behaviour and relationships in schools that I would come back to Parliament with proposals. I have yet to receive proposals from my officials on that, but I do intend to take action on this matter before the end of the parliamentary session. I gave Mr Kerr an undertaking on this last week and I asked Mr Kerr really to respond. Is this the best he can do for Scotland's children and young people? Let's work together more positively and consensually to deliver the improvements we need to see in Scottish education. St That's Stephen, my challenge to Stephen him. Kerr, I would encourage interventions to be a little briefer, <laughs> not just from the Cabinet Secretary, but from Mr Kerr himself. Mr Kerr, I'll give you some of that time back. Thank you very much. Well, th well, there we have it. That was the response from the Cabinet Secretary. But this government is now in its 17th year in office. It can't hide its record in education behind the national discussion. That is my point. So my message to Jenny Gilruth and her colleagues is straightforward. Please listen. Listen to what the people are saying is going wrong and act on it. The final report of the national discussion, All Learners in Scotland Matter, and I have read it, and by the way, I think we should have published it long before 10 to 3. It's a separate matter. Is what the people of Scotland are telling us loud and clear and that's why this report should actually make these ministers feel very uncomfortable indeed. Because I repeat, we're in the 17th year of a government that said education was its number one priority. But listen to the... Yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful to Stephen Kerr to give way. And would you agree with me that after 17 years, it should be of extreme concern that what the young people responded to in this consultation was a fear about being at school? Absolutely. Stephen Kerr. And I'm going to quote from the report. 9.3. We heard many concerns about whether the national discussion would lead to genuine action and significant change. And goes on. We heard frustration, cynicism or anger in some cases about whether transformational education reform as recommended by the Muir Review would be implemented in Scotland. We heard concerns about whether there would be a tendency to continue the status quo rather than embracing an opportunity for the entire system to do things differently. 9.3. So as we enter the 17th year of this SNP government, people feel cheated. They feel let down, they feel angry. They've seen an SNP government big on words, big on promises, infinitesimally small on delivery. But I will. John Swinney. I'm grateful to Mr Kerr for giving way. Does Mr Kerr welcome the fact that on the most recent data, a record number of young people are leaving Scottish education to go to positive destinations at 95.7%? Does that not in any way register on Mr Kerr's view of the world has been a good thing? Stephen Kerr. Of course, I welcome positive destinations, but the definition this government uses to the positive destinations, it can mean just about anything. And the tracking, it only goes for so many months after the, after the young people leave school. I'm afraid that it leaves a lot to be desired. That is my honest response to that intervention from John Swinney. Much needs to be improved. But going back to the report, there is a groundswell, as has been referred to, of current support for educational improvement, which cannot be lost, ignored or sidelined. Again, 9.3. And Professors Campbell and Harris, the independent facilitators, conclude, so now is the time for action, most critically, time for the right action. My question is, will this Cabinet Secretary set herself apart from her predecessors? Will she take action? that parents, teachers and school leaders are begging for to reform Scotland's education system. Now, we all know the business of government is the business of tough choices. And the Cabinet Secretary isn't going to be able to please everybody because doing the right things very often results in at least temporary unpopularity. But if Jenny Gilruth makes the right decisions for Scottish educational reform and she meets resistance, I can assure her we in these benches will support her. I hope the events that uh, lie ahead will show that we are fortunate.
to have a former teacher as the Cabinet Secretary for Education. I know that she will empathise with the concerns writ large in this report about teacher recruitment and retention should have been fixed a long time ago. The report highlights the job insecurity too many teachers experience. How can teachers, particularly newly qualified teachers, plan their future lives when they are stuck on a temporary contract? Mm -hmm. And the report goes on. We heard about exhaustion, stress, anxiety, burnout, affecting people's capacity to do their work and negatively impacting their personal lives. That's 6.1.22. This is, what we are, this is what we were talking about last week when we called on the government to provide extra support to teachers in the form of a national helpline. Employee helplines are very common in businesses and other organisations. There's something that can be done now to provide teachers with an outlet because we need to rebuild teacher morale. Mm -hmm. Comments for teachers and pupil support assistants speak of a profession of roles that have been underappreciated for far too long. And this is why the Scottish Conservatives have called for a new deal for teachers. And this report backs up what we are talking about. We want to see reduced contact hours for teachers to plan and prepare lessons. Teachers paid for extracurricular activities. Competitive salaries offered for specialist subject teachers. Cuts to excessive bureaucracy to let teachers teach. The opportunity for teacher sabbaticals to help them develop professionally and new pathways into teaching to attract the best talent. And beyond these proposals, there are three specific issues that I hope I have time to mention that we need to openly and calmly debate. Firstly, the autonomy of head teachers. I have always felt that it was far better to trust head teachers to run the schools they know and the school populations they know in the communities that, that they know than to leave decisions in the hands of national, regional or local authority managers. There must be accountability and we need to give careful thought as to how that can be best achieved. But head teachers should have the freedom to innovate and lead according to the needs of the pupils in their care. Secondly, I don't know if I have time. Do I have time? You've got a bit of time back. But I will were... take an intervention. Ross Greer, briefly. Thanks. I'm grateful to the member for taking the intervention. I strongly agree on the uh, need for more autonomy at schools. But the member may be familiar with proposals in the last session for a head teacher's charter. When the Education Committee took evidence on that with 32 head teachers, their response was unanimous. They wanted the school to be empowered. They did not, as an individual, want to be empowered because they wanted their whole team to take that approach to making decisions in their school. Stephen Kerr. Leaders in any walk of life are leaders that lead teams of people. That's a fact, so I don't disagree with that. So secondly, there's a great deal in the report about the value of play-based learning. So we should review formal schooling starting age, perhaps to, the age, to age six. The starting age is six in Germany, Spain, Denmark, Sweden and Norway, and is seven in Finland and South Korea. Something we should look at. Thirdly, we need to give serious consideration to the presumption of mainstreaming for children with additional support needs. There is clear evidence in the report that what we have currently is not working. The report recounts concerning and troubling experiences from parents about their child, this is a quote, not receiving timely and necessary supports and sometimes inappropriate use of exclusions and other sanctions. The need for appropriate ASM provision is now urgent. 5.2.10. In large classes, pupils with additional support needs struggle to learn. Their classmates struggle with their sometimes distressed behaviour. It is high time we address this. The people of Scotland care passionately about their education system. The end of the report states, quote, the scale of the response is unprecedented in the history of national engagements about Scottish education, 9.2. That makes me proud, proud to be part of this great nation, that we care so passionately about our education system. But here's what the, here's what the report concludes, and I will conclude. Quote, one thing is clear, there is an overwhelming appetite for change. Presiding officer, the people of Scotland are watching and waiting. We urgently await action from this SNP government. More words won't cut it, and I call on the government to show teachers, school leaders, parents and pupils that they have listened to the national discussion and will now act on it.
Thank you, Mr. Kerr. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to and move Amendment 9213.1 uh, around seven minutes. Ms. Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. It is always a privilege to open for Scottish Labour to discuss their education. The education system is where children grow and learn, and it is the foundation of the future of the next generation. That is why it is imperative that we get it right, and why it is so important to listen and take on board all that has come through this national discussion, an opportunity which has been said has seen an unprecedented level of response to the engagement on the education system here. No small feat, and one that should be commended. I want to say a particular thank you to the 26,000 children and young people who took part, and to Professor Carol Campbell and Professor Alma Harris, who have produced the report. And I also want to say from the outset that we will support the Government motion today. One thing is clear, and we cannot emphasise this enough. There is an overwhelming appetite for change. Now is the time for action, most critically the right action. As colleagues have already said, those are not just my words, but are from the conclusion of the report, drawing on responses from tens of thousands of young people, teachers, pupils, employers and trade unions. There is no ambiguity in that statement. Those that have engaged are telling us clearly that things are not working as they are. But the fact is, much of what they have said and what they're calling for is not new. It is a reiteration of much of what they have been saying and Scottish Labour have been telling the government for years, only to be met with broken promises and a lack of action, which is why a discussion designed to focus on the future of the system, a great deal in that discussion, a great deal of what was heard was about contemporary challenges and issues, a lack of adequate resource, disjointed policy, a labour-intensive curriculum that is cluttered and has unwieldy requirements and outcomes, creating gaps between its principle and how it is applied in practice. Had the government stuck to the promises that it has made over the years, perhaps these problems would not be so entrenched. But the reality is that a fundamental failure to stick to its own commitments on increasing teacher numbers, reducing non-contact time and making class sizes smaller, to name a few, in many places is actually rolling back, has left teachers with the impossible task of trying to deliver truly person-centred education in a system that is overstretched and constrained by a lack of resource particularly while they themselves are plagued by exhaustion and burnout, facing an ever-increasing and intensifying workload, battling poor conditions. Change that is visible is not just overdue, it is urgent. The system is already beginning to unravel, and that must be halted. One of the key messages from young people who participated in this engagement exercise, as my colleague Martin Whitfield has, has already highlighted, was that they wanted to feel safe and secure, free from bullying, intimidation and harassment. In my view, it is absolutely extraordinary that safety is the number one priority for learners. They should not have to worry that safety would be anything other than a given for themselves and for their teachers. But this chamber knows only too well that the current environment in schools for many is not safe or secure and it is not inclusive either. So it is no surprise that the discussion has been overwhelmingly absolute in its conclusion that more must be done on this, particularly if we are to achieve the principal vision set out that all learners matter. Design officer, more than a third of children in Scotland, school, in Scotland schools are now identified as having an additional support need. Such a large proportion of the pupil population means that this is no longer an additional but a fundamental part of our education system, which makes the fact that the number of ASN teachers has fallen even more galling. Yet it's all too clear that the current approach to additional support needs is failing. And again, the words of teachers, parents and learners, not just mine. It is failing the children who need additional support. And members will know that I believe that this is in at least part for disabled people because of the need to legislate for a more accountable person-centered system. But as the report also makes clear, it is because there are insufficient resources and support, including staffing and specialists, to fully enable them. The reality is summed up by the concerning and troubling experiences shared by parents as part of this consultation of their children not receiving timely or necessary support, which witnesses have also shared with the Education, Children and Young People Committee. And they're failing to those without additional support needs who are losing out on the support they need because teachers' time is therefore stretched. Neither of these situations is acceptable or can continue. An education system fit for the future must be welcoming and inclusive of all children to enable everyone to learn and flourish, to give all children a fighting chance. That requires time and space for educational professionals and support staff to develop their knowledge, expertise and practice, and to think and strategically. To do that, the report is clear. 
implementation of the existing government commitment to increasing non-contact time is necessary. This is not only crucial for addressing the ongoing support needs of pupils in Scotland, but it is key to ensuring we give teachers time to get involved in developing their profession and education in Scotland. We need to put teachers closer to where decisions on what happens in the classroom are made. Or, as the General Teaching Council have said ahead of today's debate, give policy about teaching back to the profession with the appropriate space and time to think and teach with impact. Ensuring education is fit for the future also requires staffing in schools that is stable to ensure continuation of high quality teaching, but instead we have got high teacher turnover across the country. I think we can all agree that teachers are valuable, but to, to retain them we must now show them that we value them. That starts by giving them the time they have been desperately asking for. Presiding officer, we welcome this discussion, but we must now all agree that the report it has produced is a stark warning that the time for talk is over and the time to act is now. There can be no more broken promises or delay. The SNP Government must heed today's report and what teachers, unions, pupils and Scottish Labour have said for a long time that much is still to be done and they must get on and do it. If they do this, if they act, we will support them in their pursuit of an education system in Scotland fit for the future, for the good of our children, for our future. It is time for change. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Glancy. I now call Willie Rennie uh, up to six minutes, Mr Rennie. I want to just read a, an abridged um, quotation from, from the report. Um, in my class of 30, four have ASD, three long-standing separation anxiety difficulties. One has been adopted, one has a difficult home life and experienced a form of trauma. One is a young carer. Two others have severe learning difficulties. Eight, in addition, have normal behind-track difficulties. There is only one of me. I can't give those 12 children enough of my attention to support their well-being, never mind their other 18 children in the class. That's the harsh reality of the additional support needs that I made an intervention with the Minister on. She understands how challenging it is for those individual teachers to cope with those circumstances and meet all the needs of all the pupils, because it is about getting it right for every child. We had hoped that the Morgan Review would actually be a start of real change, but I'm afraid, and I think the Minister knows this, that we're nowhere even near the start. And this should be a wake-up call, this report, to have a dramatic change. Of course, I'm in favour of the presumption of mainstreaming. I think it's the right thing to do. It doesn't mean it's always appropriate, but it should be the presumption in favour of doing that. But if we are going to have that presumption, we need to have the resources to match it so that this teacher here, who is struggling to cope with a variety of needs within our class, gets the support that she needs in order to be able to deliver uh, on that. Yes, certainly. Christine Graham. So you actually quoted from part I was going to quote from. I very much agree with it. It should be a presumption. But do you sometimes get the feeling that in some schools it's almost mandatory and it's not always in the interests of the child with, let's say, severe behavioural difficulties, nor in the other members of the class? Holy Rennie. Frank, I don't know. Um, I hear reports of teachers who really struggle to cope with a variety of different demands. I think they would love to have that great diversity in the class so that every single child gets the opportunity. But we should be challenging this to make sure it is the right decision. And that's what I think this debate helps with today. But I think every member in this parliament has been around the school and has seen, as the minister has highlighted, the joy of learning. The fact that we are proud of what so much of our pupils and our teachers and our staff, and we shouldn't forget the other members of staff in the school who do a brilliant job. But our job in this parliament is to challenge. We should be impatient for improvement. So when we challenge it, it's not because we're against the education system or against schools or pupils or teachers or the staff, but we want improvement and we should be hungry for that change. And that's why I will repeatedly challenge the government on the casualisation of the workforce, particularly in primary schools, where, where young people often go for six years on the trot with one temporary contract after the other. I mean, it's just demoralising. They thought they were going to be able to craft young minds so that they'd be the workforce of the future, but they're really just struggling to stay alive 
in the teaching profession, which is why so many of them are leaving the position. Yes, certainly. John Sweeney. I'm very grateful to Willie Rennie for giving way, and I think he alights on a very serious issue about the length of contracts that are given to newly qualified teachers. And does he acknowledge that not all of those issues, in fact, none of them, are in the control of the government, and all of them are in the control of local authorities who have been given the line of sight of resources that should enable them to give full-time contracts? What would Mr Rennie propose that should be done in those circumstances? Willie Rennie, I mean, can give you some of that time back. I, I mean, I, I, I think um, John Swinney is right. The, there is a partnership here that's required to work with local authorities to make this work, and the government did make an improvement to baseline quite a lot of the funding, which helped with that. Um, we have got a surplus, I have to say, of trained teachers who are coming through the system, and we do need to te talk to the, um, the ITEs to make sure that we've got the right supply and the right experience. I mean, we're short of secondary and we don't have enough primary. But ultimately, we do need to challenge local authorities to make sure that they are providing the, the permanent contracts when it's possible eh, to do so. So I think eh, John Swinney is right, but the government have got a big responsibility to make sure the pipeline of workers is sufficient of the right complex needs to make sure that we are able to get people long term. I'm actually going to be running out of time. I would love to take an intervention. I've only really just started. And on the exams reform, I would just urge caution. I think we heard um, from the report about many people who are wanting a uh, quite dramatic change in the use of exams and the number of qualifications. But this is big changes. We need to make sure we take employers and universities and colleges with us, as well as parents uh, and pupils. We need to deal with the two-term dash. We also need to deal with the, the interface between the broad general education and the senior phase. I think there are some steps, and I can go through it with the Minister, that we could take now within the next few years as some tweaking to make it those issues uh, a bit better. We need to put knowledge back. The, we need to put a greater emphasis of knowledge within the curriculum. Of course, we need to have uh, transferable skills, cross-disciplinary thinking, problem solving, but you need a good foundation of knowledge before you can apply those various skills. We need to get the contact time reduced by the 90 minutes that the Minister and our government have promised. We need to make sure, with, through Curriculum for Excellence, rather than cutting uh, teachers adrift, which I think was the experience from the early days of Curriculum for Excellence, we need to stop them reinventing the wheel almost every single year with courses. We need to make sure that the new national bodies provide course materials that they can deploy and use their skills um, to um, utilise. We need to make sure that the vocational education has got a parity of esteem with the academic route. There's one quote in the report about an employer saying that vocational and technical routes are not worthy of an exam or qualification. Well, they do have lots of exams and qualifications, but the fact that that employer didn't know about it was an indication that we have got a failure of communication with employers. The SCQF framework is, is good. It gives us an opportunity to get that parity of esteem in the developing your, your, you do your need workforce to conclude, too. Mr. Rennie. If I can just say this in conclusion. I know the minister is new. But our government is 16 years old, and we do need to see results. We've covered many of the issues this afternoon. We will cover many more. But there is an expectation that the government and the minister will deliver, and she'll forgive us for being very hard on her if she doesn't. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We now move to the open debate. Um, there really isn't um, any more time in hand, so uh, interventions will need to be accommodated in the... Uh, time allocations. I call first Ruth Maguire to be followed by Liz Smith uh, for up to six minutes. Ms Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What kind of education will be needed by children and young people in the future and how do we make that a reality? That was the important central question that guided the national discussion. I welcome the publication of All Learners in Scotland Matter, our national discussion on education, and I'm happy to speak in support of the government's motion, which acknowledges the significant levels of engagement that the national discussion generated. There were events and discussions in every part of Scotland, events and discussions led by schools, community groups, third sector organisations. This was the biggest public engagement exercise on education to have been undertaken nationally in Scottish education, and it reached more than 38,000 people, 26,000 children and young people. Tasked with building a compelling, consensual, renewed vision, the agreed vision speaks directly to the voices of children who said again and again that what they wanted 
was a safe, inclusive education system which valued everyone and celebrated all kinds of success. I do think it's worth hearing that vision in full. Children and young people are at the heart of education in Scotland. The Scottish education system values collaborative partnerships that engage all learners. The people who work within and with the education system, parents and carers to ensure that all learners in Scotland matter. All learners are supported in inclusive learning environments, which are safe, welcoming, caring and proactively address any barriers to learning and inequalities or inequities that exist or arise. Education in Scotland nurtures the unique talents of all learners, ensuring their achievement, progress and well-being. Each child and young person in Scotland has high quality learning experiences which respect their rights and represents the diversity of who they are, the communities they live in. Each child and young person receives great teaching, resources and support for joyful learning that builds their confidence and equips them to be successful and to contribute to their life, work and world so they know how much they matter. A line in the report stuck out to me, and I think for us politicians, it might be a helpful guiding principle as we navigate our way through the coming reforms and scrutiny of the bold changes that may be required. And that is to balance realism of what is needed now with inspiring optimism for education in Scotland. The report into the national discussion recognises that more could be done to support the quality and consistency of the implementation of existing policies and practices. But importantly, it also notes the strength of what we do have here in Scotland and features of the Scottish education system that must be continued and further enhanced, such as a commitment to valuing children and young people's views, a broad-based education, the foundational importance of literacy and numeracy, the development of wellbeing, the pursuit of equity and equality, respect for a graduate level teaching profession, the importance of work and working conditions to all members of the education workforce, and that partnership that the Cabinet Secretary spoke about with parents, carers, communities and agencies, specialists and services. Ahead of the debate, um, YouthLink Scotland provided a helpful briefing note in which they state that Scottish education can remain too narrowly defined and too often understood as formal learning planned for and delivered by teachers in a formal setting. The purpose of Scottish education is to ensure that all our children and young people develop the knowledge, skills and attributes to reach their potential in learning, life and work. I agree with YouthLink Scotland that youth work in all its forms can complement and enhance the delivery of the formal curriculum and the provision of support for pupils. It contributes greatly to raising attainment and to improving outcomes for children and young people. A future Scottish education system will need to not offer not just high quality teaching and learning, but also different learning pathways. The report talks of the need to reignite the joy of learning. And I strongly welcome that play and outdoor learning are specifically mentioned in there. I know not just as an MSP, but also as a parent and perhaps even indeed as somebody who wasn't naturally inclined to thrive indoors in a classroom, just how important youth work is. Any ambitious, inclusive, supportive system with children's rights at its heart will be clear that youth work is part of education. It would be helpful in closing if the Cabinet Secretary could talk a little to how the National Youth Work Strategy will link into the educational reforms that are coming. President Officer, I'll end on that balance of realism and optimism. I want to acknowledge um, the issues that we do have and acknowledge the challenges that we face around investment. We face those challenges right across our public services. We're operating in hugely challenging times. For meaningful educational reform that truly, truly reflects all learners matter, there will be difficult choices to make. The optimism bit though, the vision is there and I believe that we do have all the skills and resources in Scotland to achieve it. Presiding officer. Thank you. I now call Liz Smith to be followed by Christine Graham around six minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, when Nicola Sturgeon uh, told education leaders in August 2015 that education was her number one priority, I think the vast majority of people across Scotland, certainly in this chamber, agreed with her. I certainly did. Uh, so when six months later she reiterated that commitment and told us that there was a new education bill forthcoming promising greater devolution to schools, I was very encouraged. 
I was never somebody who would subscribe to the view that everything in our schools was going badly wrong, but neither did I subscribe to the view that everything was well and that the status quo was acceptable. And I, in fact, I remember uh, John Swinney at the time, and I hope I um, quote him correctly, when he said uh, on the cusp of introducing an education reform bill that the status quo was not an option. And he was absolutely right in that comment. Now, interesting as some of the feedback is, I do wonder if we had been quite in the same place if the Scottish Government had both listened to and acted upon the collective findings of the Donaldson, McCormack, Cameron and Bloomer reviews in Scottish school education, all carried out by experts in their respective fields between 2011 and 2016, because the collective message then was that while Scottish education had much on which to pride itself, the school system needed to be shaken out of its complacency. And incidentally, exactly the same conclusion had been uh, the, the case with the proposed Howie reforms way back in 1992. Of course, these reports between 2011 and 2016 appeared at the very same time that the OECD, the Scottish Survey of Attainment, PISA, Reform Scotland, the Scottish Government's own statistics, all produced compelling evidence that Scotland was flatlining when it came to attainment, and worse still, that the attainment gap between rich and poor was widening, thereby disadvantaging large numbers of young people, something that was uh, always fundamentally at odds with the basic principles of good Scottish education, once renowned across the world. The 2017 programme for government proclaimed, and I quote, a new education bill will deliver the biggest and most radical change on how our schools are run. Nicola Sturgeon went further, and she wrote in Scotland on Sunday an article about the London model of cluster schools, that that was worth looking at, given that they were quite clearly delivering results for more disadvantaged pupils. And I have to say, I was extremely disappointed when all of that got dropped for some reason. Presiding officer, three things above all else matter to me. Firstly, that teachers have not been sufficiently valued as key professionals. Graham Donaldson had interesting things to say about that, particularly when he said that too many teachers were reporting that they felt uncomfortable with regard to some gaps in their professional training. And of course, it doesn't help when we see the soaring numbers of cases of verbal and physical assaults on teachers, which Stephen Kerr's debate highlighted last week, and which I know my colleagues across the chamber um, will attempt to deal with. Secondly, the Scottish Government has shown an extraordinary unwillingness to properly reform the education agencies, not just to rebadge them and move the deck chairs around a bit, but to properly reform them to enhance the support that is available to teachers. No one can argue that Education Scotland and SQA have had a happy history in recent times. Indeed, when I was on the Education Committee of this Parliament for a substantial number of years, hardly a term went past when uh, the committee's attention was not being drawn to significant problems within the agencies, problems which meant that teachers felt remote uh, and rather frustrated uh, about the education agencies, and that can never be a good blueprint for a successful education system. But the main message, I think, of the national conversation is that education cannot stand still and that school leaders uh, should not expect the curriculum to do either. Which brings me to my third point, and it's one that members have heard me raise in this chamber over many years, but I do so again because I am utterly convinced that it matters, and that is the question of the extracurriculum. If you ask yourself, what is education for, and we should all do this, we need to consider the intrinsic value of education, because it is in the difficult and perhaps perplexing quest for the answer to this question that we need to stand back and ask ourselves, from a holistic perspective, what we should be doing to ensure that schools provide education that is in the round. Extracurricular activity, or perhaps it's better named as co-curricular activity, has so many different definitions, but it is an integral part of this process. Now, this is not popular in some quarters. After all, extracurricular activity is not measurable. And in the same way that you might expect to have uh, scores of test results or um, passes at SQA, but it matters so much to young people. Because, Deputy Presiding Officer, I don't believe that this type of activi activity can either be or should be um, condemned to obsessive quantitative measurement. For so many pupils, these activities are the most enriching. They help them to make decisions and difficult decisions. They build confidence and self-esteem, understanding what commitment means, what responsibility means, working in teams. 
And in this post-COVID era, when so many youngsters' lives are beset by anxiety, these skills are an increasingly priceless asset. I believe this as a teacher between 1983 and 1998, and I continue to believe it in my 17 years in this place, which is the very reason for my outdoor education bill. And I'm glad to see that the Welsh Synod uh, with Sam Rowlands is doing the same, and there's a likely one at Westminster with Tim Farron. Deputy Presiding Officer, we have a huge opportunity to get our education system right, but we need to be far-sighted. We need a vision of Scottish education in an all-round capacity, a vision that will not just suit the economy, but one which promotes a fair-minded and ethical society in which individuals are valued for who they are. So I support the amendment in the name of Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Uh, up to six minutes. Ms. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The education landscape has indeed changed beyond recognition over just a few decades, as has the world around us. From the education I had in the 50s and 60s to the education I delivered as a secondary teacher in the 70s and 80s to today, there are worlds of difference in and outside the classroom. From the online world and technology, the needs of society continue to change and accelerate. What is taught will have to adapt, while also focusing on ensuring children have the basic tools of numeracy and literacy. And indeed, there's much to be recommended, the broad base of our education syllabus, particularly in secondary and beyond to tertiary. However, I welcome the wide-ranging report, which endeavours to provide a broad discussion about what our children need in today's world to help them thrive and indeed contribute in their own way to society, but to make schools a place where inequalities are minimised, diminished, and most importantly, are a safe and happy place to be. I will focus first on, for me, the linchpin of that success, the teachers themselves. Something that remains constant is the value of a good teacher, and there are many good teachers. Some of us here, no doubt, can easily recall the good and distinguish from the mediocre, no matter how distant our learning experience. That evidence is the impact of the quality of teaching has on us even decades on. And this is recognised in the report. Quotes, One very strong theme that featured heavily in the responses to the national discussion was the importance of valuing and appreciating all educational professionals working with and within schools. We listened to some robust views about the importance of teachers and the need for more support staff, including classroom assistants, learning assistants, support for learning staff and pupil support staff. We heard about the importance of class sizes, affecting how much time and attention a teacher or support staff member could give to each individual child or young person. Close quotes. Class sizes come next for me. The smaller the class, the easier it is to teach to give time to each child. I once taught a class of 40 and another of 16. And how I taught was determined not just by the character of that class, but the size itself. That, for me, is self-evident. Add in now inclusivity, which is to be welcomed, but is not, for me, the answer for all children with, say, severe learning difficulties or behavioural issues, not just for their development and well-being, but for the other children in the class. And I refer to my intervention on Willie Rennie. There is a question about whether it's best for a child, say, with very difficult behavioural issues, to be in a mainstream class. I repeat, in my casework, it sometimes seems to me that what is a presumption verges on the mandatory. I would add that I've had representations from parents with children needing substantial support in order to remain mainstream, concerned themselves that this is not the best for their child's development. This is especially the case if there are many children in a class requiring additional support. Turning to an issue which often again comes into my case where that is the testy matter of how a school can deal with bullying. I quote again from the report, quotes, within the national discussion we heard many times how important it was for pupils of all ages to feel secure and free from any form of bullying, intimidation or harassment. However, it is again my casework experience that policies in certain schools are not always effective at striking that balance between the bully and the bullied. I appreciate that this is a difficult balance, and I do know, for example, that Scottish Borders Council is reviewing its bullying policy. For some parents, for example, there is the perception that every effort is made to keep the bully in school 
and not the bullied child. I also understand the position that some 30,000 children have caring responsibilities, which they might not always disclose to, say, a teacher, sometimes to protect a parent out of fear, whether baseless or not, that social work might then remove them from the situation. For example, if that child is supporting a parent with addiction problems. Of course, there will be a duty upon a teacher of concerns about a child's well-being rings alarm bells to bring the attention to the appropriate authority. So we ask a lot of our teachers, and even more beyond my time in the classroom. Teachers, in my view, need also to have more in-class support and more non-teaching time, for example, for continued professional development. Sometimes you're just so busy, you haven't got time to do anything else. Finally, you can educate in its broadest terms, even in a dilapidated hut, though that is not a suggestion from me to the government. For me, it can come down in the simplest terms to the teacher, the in-class support, and the size of that class. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And I call uh, Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Up to six minutes, Mr. Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Scottish Government are finally taking charge on the future of education in Scotland. Our education sector has been wrecked with 16 years of SNP's failure. Failure to support teachers, failure to support pupils with additional support needs, and failure to update an outdated and narrowing curriculum. I've got a lot to go uh, and uh, as some of my colleagues have already pointed out, in the last 16 years, teachers' number have fallen. The number of teachers in Scotland has fallen by 907 since 2007. The Scottish Government have not yet delivered on their promise to hire 3,500 teachers and people's support assistant. This puts a strain on both teachers and pupils and negative impacts class sizes. Teachers were also promised 90 minutes of non-contact time per week. The Scottish Government, government have made little progress in the meeting this. Teachers in our education system need to be valued and given time to think about and plan their teaching and learning outcomes. Teachers are not the only ones in our schools struggling. People support assistance provided essential support for children, children's education and social development. But there is currently a crisis in retention and recruitment of PSAs. This is primarily due to PSAs being underpaid and undertrained to deal with the demands of the job. PSAs often work with children with additional support needs without adequate training or support. This only further exacerbates the lack of support available to children with additional support needs. A lack of PSAs in classroom can create unsafe working condition and can decrease attainment for children. Yet the Scottish Government have yet to outline exactly how they plan to support this vital role in school that is heavily relied on both by teachers and pupils. Last week in Parliament, there was a debate on violence in school. Violence from children towards other pupils or staff is often left to people's support assistance to handle. I've heard stories from constituents about the daily violence they experience in the workplaces as PSAs. They are often the ones who deal with the brunt of violent behaviors and relieve classes uh, of violent disruptions. Yet they receive little support or training on how to effectively deal with the violence in their workplace, which once again causes me to leave the profession. The Scottish Government must move forward showing teachers and support staff that they are listened and valued within our education system. Only then can we actually be, uh, begin to improve the situation. Presiding officer, 
there also need to be some development in the curriculum being taught in our schools. The narrowing of the curriculum for excellences does not effectively prepare young people for the future. Our education system should prepare children and young people to deal with the major social, economic, cultural, personal, and political challenges that are present in the 21st century. The current curriculum for ex excellence is ill-equipped to teach young people about this important aspect of life. The Scottish Government recently announced uh, Scottish Connection Framework addresses the need to deal with the more difficult parts of Scotland's history, including colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. This commitment to address the atrocities of the past also needs to be done at home and in our schools. Presiding officer, through learning about the past and Scotland's role in it, young people can be more open and understanding to the racial, cultural, and gender inequalities that still exist in Scotland today. That way, we can send young people away from the education system more tolerant and with a better understanding of the social challenges that may face them outside of school. Presiding officer, progress on the government's reform of education is welcome. However, it cannot be another broken promise. If anything is to be fixed, the SNP must recognize what the last 16 years have done to our education system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. I now call uh, Fergus Ewing to be followed by Ross Greer. Up to six minutes, Mr. Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, it's a real pleasure warmly to welcome to her role. This is the first opportunity I've had the new Cabinet Secretary, and I've no doubt that she brings uh, with her energy, enthusiasm, and a great deal of effort and wish her well. It will come as no surprise to members that I will focus my remarks on what I consider will be the huge benefits, the enormous benefits that will accrue uh, to our economy, to our society, particularly to our children, by teaching touch typing, a skill, a, a skill which I believe is one of the most valuable that we can possess for our working and personal lives and for the remainder of the century. Now, this is Mark IV of this speech, so I will cover well hallowed. Well, of course. Stephen Kerr. Mr. President, Stephen Kerr, you'll be absolutely delighted to know that at the Scottish Conservative Conference at the end of April, the Scottish Conservatives have adopted life and learning skills into our national policy, including keyboard skills. I'm sure you'll be absolutely Fer delighted to hear Fergus that. Fergus you. Well, I'm delighted to hear that, and I think it displays a particular intelligence on the part of the Conservative Party. Uh, <laughs> um, my, my attempts thus far to persuade... Uh, uh, certainly, Mr Whitfield. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful, Fergus, you in giving way, and to, and to match the fourth rendition of this speech, I think it's also right to say that touch typing exists within the curriculum for excellence as one of the skills anyway in the IT. And yes, keyboard skills are hugely important, but actually it's the skill of touch typing that frees our young people from the physical challenges of physically writing, particularly um, in the case of children with dyslexia. Fergus, you. Yes, I totally agree with Mr. Whitfield. It is in the curriculum, but the, the problem is that whilst it's in the curriculum, supervision, which is essential, is not provided. And I'll come on to that. But, um, my, my attempts have failed thus far, but I... But, oh, of course I will, yes, of course. Willie Rennie, I think briefly. members might see a, a slight bit of coordination today. Um, but, but, but as a, somebody who types with his thumbs, I think there should be a greater education on touch typing in schools, and I hope we can persuade uh, the Minister to perhaps task somebody to make sure that it's given greater uh, priority. Fergus, you. Um, well, I'm extremely grateful to Mr Rennie, and this spontaneous expression and outburst of cross-party support is, of course, extremely welcome, but it is very serious because it does show, presiding officer, this is not a partisan political issue. There's absolutely nothing I've got to say that has anything to do with party politics at all. It's all about the enormous benefits that I think can be achieved for virtually zero cost, just teaching the teachers to to train teachers how to supervise young people. The average length of 
of time it takes for a young person in supervision is 15 to 20 hours. That's a blink of the eye when one thinks of the time that children spend in school. Uh, here are some of the benefits. With a short investment of time and money, children gain one of the best life skills and use daily in their work and for personal purposes. It sees a great improvement of self-esteem and confidence in young people, something that's so important and empowering. When children feel confident, they can succeed. If they're worried, if they're afraid, then perhaps it's far more difficult. And for adults, the productivity potential benefits are simply astounding. A touch type in a typical six-hour day will complete up to three times more work than those without the skill. You know, we hear frequently broad aims, aspirations, let's increase productivity. Very rarely do you hear about a very specific, clear-cut, concrete measure that can actually do it. This is it. I can't think of any more efficacious way to increase productivity and empower people in their workplace to do uh, work at a much faster rate. Certainly, I'll take uh, another intervention. I'm very grateful to the member, and I, really, I, I very much agree with him. Can I also introduce to that, if we're going to talk about productivity, the importance of being physically active all the way through your school life? Fergus Ewing. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. I wanted particularly to say, presenting also to the Cabinet Secretary, that the information I have, uh, and it actually comes from, from members in this chamber as well, and their own personal experiences, and their own personal lives and families, is that it's especially children with special needs, as Willie Rennie alluded to earlier, uh, with dyslexia, with autism, that can particularly benefit from the acquisition of this skill, moving from uh, a, a life of, of difficulty, challenge, worry, to a life of confidence, self-esteem, self-esteem and self-regard. So I wanted specifically to mention that. And one parent gave this testimonial, our eldest son is dyslexic, learning to touch type has unlocked his academic potential in a way unimaginable before this course. Um, also, I'll, I'll discard the last three pages of the speech, but, well, everybody's heard it before anyway. Um, what, what I just want to stress is this. Um, I had a courteous hearing, along with Dan and Robin Gifford, who run a trading company called Touch by Type, and to, to whom I'm extremely grateful for a very detailed briefing. And I know they've spoken to other members too. And... Uh, she did, makes the point that after running courses for 10 years, she says, I've yet to find anyone, anyone who's mastered the skill through self-learning. It requires repetition, encouragement, and structured direction. Uh, and therefore, the reply I received on the 2nd of August last year from the Cabinet Secretary's predecessor that touch typing materials are available is fine. That's great. That's a start. But it's not enough. Supervision is required. After all, in conclusion, presiding officer, one would not expect a child to learn how to play the piano or violin or any other musical instrument without tuition or supervision. And therefore, why should it be different when one is learning how to use a different type of instrument and one that can empower people for the rest of their lives at almost zero cost, zero time, uh, and... Uh, uh, which I believe would make a substantial uh, benefit for the people of Scotland and the economy over the decades to come. Thank you. I call Ross Greer to be followed by John Swinney. Thank you, President Officer. The package of education reforms to be delivered in this session of Parliament are the biggest since the Curriculum for Excellence was introduced. Indeed, in the case of the Hayward recommendations that I expect we'll see, they could be the biggest set of reforms since the Victorian era in, in that particular area. Some of them are overdue. Some are the result of the pandemic, and we probably wouldn't have had this opportunity otherwise. But they're all a hugely exciting opportunity. Organisational reform is absolutely critical to this, but even with really good consultation efforts, that can be pretty impenetrable or at least quite distant to most people. 
The national discussion was an opportunity for wider society to engage in this debate on the future of Scottish education. I think it's been successful at that. We often hear the frustration that people have that uh, government consultations and their scope don't allow them to talk about the issue that they really wanted to bring to the table. So I think we should congratulate Professors Campbell and Harris for their approach, allowing people to bring whatever issue they had to the table to discuss the future of education. And debates in this area can often be quite challenging for not just the public, but for politicians as well, due to gatekeeping by established powers within our education system. In fact, in Professor Muir's recommendation for a national discussion, he made clear that it needed to prevent the narrative privilege of existing organisations. And I think that's been achieved here because I can't detect the suffocating hand of the SQA and Education Scotland in this final report. Now, that is easier to do in this area than it is in organisational reform. But I think there are lessons to be learned for the officials leading on the organisational reform in terms of consultation and engagement with pupils, with teachers and with wider society on what they need. Like the OECD report, the national discussion reinforces the core strengths of the curriculum. Its vision statement aligns with the core premise of the curriculum for excellence. And the report notes that much of what's in the vision isn't new. The vision and values are easy to agree to, though. I expect even where in the areas of most significant disagreement between all of us here, we could come together and agree on a set of common values. What we really need in our education system is more challenge. Even what's in the call to action here is broadly pretty agreeable. And if I have one concern about this, it's that those existing powers, those with the narrative privilege in education, can agree to what's in this report and say that what they're already doing will fulfill it, which is why we need that greater challenge. And I really welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to drive forward substantial reforms across the system. Oh. Yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful to ask you to give way on that point. Would you agree with me that actually those people who've contributed and um, you, you, you indicate has been successful, will it not only be successful for those contributors if they actually see the results come to fruition and see a change in our education system. Ross Greer. Absolutely, and uh, Mr Whitfield has robbed me of the conclusion of this speech on exactly that topic, but the, the format of uh, you said we did for the government's consultation efforts absolutely needs to be the case here, because it's right that people are cynical about this, because we've been here before in a lot of these areas. I want to focus my remarks, though, on recommendation 412, as the, the Cabinet Secretary highlighted, because I think it's fantastic that we need to reignite the joy of learning. Now, that is a great example of something that is a completely agreeable concept. Who's going to disagree with that? But it is a challenge to deliver. I think the Hayward Review is critical to that. The OECD confirmed that we're doing a pretty good job of delivering the broad general education stage of Curriculum for Excellence. But once we get into the senior phase, there's too much pressure to teach to the test rather than deliver the senior phase of the curriculum itself. So reforming our qualifications and assessment system to match our curriculum is going to be critical here. If we want to make learning more enjoyable, we also need to break it out of subject silos. And that would also far better align our qualification system with the needs of our economy. And I think the submission from the Royal Society of Edinburgh summarised that really well where they said subject-specific knowledge is no longer the primary determinant of suitability in the majority of graduate recruitment. What matters more are transferable skills and attributes, breadth of knowledge and experience, cross-disciplinary thinking and problem-solving capabilities. End quote. Yes. Liz Smith. Thank you. Could I just ask the member, um, I, I agree with what he's just said, would he be minded to support a more of a baccalaureate system to do exactly that? Ross Greer. I think there's a, a lot of merit in the baccalaureate system, as uh, Liz Smith says. I think we need, first of all, a serious appraisal of what happened with the Scottish baccalaureate efforts that were previously attempted. Why did that not have the success that many of us hoped for there? I thought Willie Rennie was right as well to say that we need to take employers and colleges and universities with us in any reform of the qualification system. Because employers want these wider set of skills to be recognised, acknowledging that in many cases they already are, but there's a, a disconnect there. Universities, though, I think are an example of where Reform of the qualifications and assessment system has already happened. Universities have raced far ahead of school-based uh, exams when it comes to that move towards continuous assessment and alternate models. I think they have a lot to contribute to how we move forward in this area. Reigniting the joy of learning, though, also requires acknowledging that learning takes place outside of schools. So if we want happy children and young people, we need a good balance of schoolwork with the rest of their lives. And that brings me to the question of homework. 
I think we know that if we were extending the school day, it would have, uh, on balance, uh, a net negative impact on children and families. But there's growing recognition that adults have a right to disconnect from their work out of hours. So we need to ask if our current levels of homework are necessary and seriously consider, I think, ending homework in primary schools. If if children need to get through that work, we need to question the curriculum itself. And if there's issues of cluttering in the curriculum, which is certainly the case in primary school, we need to resolve those. And that is compatible with giving teachers professional autonomy in the classroom. It's for them to decide how to deliver learning in class. But it's for all of us here to have responsibility for children's whole lives. School can be a place of joy if it doesn't follow children home we have significant opportunities over the next couple of years to deliver on reforms, as I said, in some cases are long overdue and in other cases have only emerged as an opportunity in the last few years. There's a lot of cynicism about our ability to deliver them, but I think what we've got here is the right package of reforms and the desire across the Chamber to make sure that we leave a lasting legacy for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you. And I call John Swinney to be followed by Sue Webber. So this is a welcome debate on the future of Scottish education. I compliment the Cabinet Secretary on the inclusive way in which she is trying to generate greater agreement, especially in this Parliament, about how our education system should develop. Securing that greater agreement matters because, quite literally, the future of our country depends upon it. In working to establish that agreement, there has to be a willingness on all sides and amongst all partners to recognise the reality of Scottish education and to be prepared to consider evidence that supports the appropriate direction of travel. In that respect, the Cabinet Secretary may have to revise, refocus or even remove some of the precious interventions of some of her predecessors. I know she will have the resolve to do so, and her predecessors will just have to come to terms with that. Equally, other parties may have to be prepared to recognise more of the strengths that truly exist in Scottish education than they are prepared to admit. I'm constantly struck by the often negative characterisation of Scottish education expressed by opposition parties in this chamber compared to what opposition members say about the performance and the achievements of individual schools in their own communities and constituencies when it comes to getting press releases and media opportunities. Oh, I seem to have touched a raw nerve with that one. So uh, I'll give way first to Pam Duncan Glancy, and then I'll give way to us. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for taking that intervention, but would he also accept that satisfaction with schools in Scotland is going down? So it's not just that the opposition are complaining or being negative. Actually, the people of Scotland are seeing the, the, the systems that they rely on declining. John Swinney. There's very high satisfaction with Scottish education and there's very high confidence. And recent opinion polling demonstrated this in the government's stewardship of education. And it's not helped by Mr Chowdhury's characterisation of the government having wrecked Scottish education. What sort of language is that? And Mr Chowdhury can't substantiate his point. And it's inappropriate language to be used to characterise the debate. And I noticed that Pam Duncan Glancy didn't use her intervention to come to the defence or to justify Mr Chowdhury's intervention either. I'll give way to Liz Smith. Liz Smith. Thank you. It's uh, most unlike Mr Swinney not to be listening to what I said, but can I just read him uh, a part of my speech that... I have never been somebody who subscribes to the view uh, that everything in our schools was going uh, badly and that um, there are lots of things that we should uh, pride ourselves on. Um, yes, there is need for change, and I think Mr Swinney was the one who said that the status quo was not acceptable. That, that, that's, that, that, that's very nice, but uh, for the five years I was Education Secretary, that didn't feel like what Liz Smith used to say to me on a fairly regular basis. Uh, the national discussion has been well steered, not surprisingly, in my view, by Professor Alma Harris and Professor Carol Campbell. Uh, they've listened with care to a wide range of voices across our education system and identified key values that should guide the development of our education system, values that are ambitious, inclusive and supportive. These are good, strong and clear values that can provide the necessary focus in our education system. The key is what steps do we take to turn those values into reality? And I'd like to raise three key elements which are critical for me in this endeavour. The first is the importance of ensuring every child or young person is ready and supported to learn. Poverty is by far the key inhibitor to ensuring every child has a chance to learn and to grow. So the work of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, the introduction of the National Minimum School Clothing Grant, the impact of the Scottish Child Payment, just three measures of this government, 
are key contributors to this process and the sincerity of others on this question about removing poverty would be demonstrated by a different approach on the question of measures to tackle poverty than those on welfare reform coming out of the current United Kingdom government. The second question is the question of teacher agency and autonomy that is referenced in the Conservative Amendment. Our children and young people will only be able to learn if they're guided by motivated professionals who have been able to develop and renew their professional capacity. I would encourage the Cabinet Secretary to intensify the focus on this element of the agenda. But that will involve Parliament supporting the Cabinet Secretary on the need for local authorities to create a more confident climate in which professionals are able to deploy their strengths and their judgments in their practice. I met far too many teachers and many head teachers who felt constrained in developing their practice by the overbearing presence of their local authority employer. If Parliament is going to value the importance of teacher agency, it has to be prepared to help the government bring that about. The Conservative contributions, Mr Kerr is not in just now, but Mr Kerr set out a whole range of different propositions, many of which I agreed with, by the way, which would be helpful to strengthen the professional capacity of teachers. They will all cost money, and lots of it. And the Conservatives are against increasing tax. They want us to cut tax, and they haven't supported the investment in the education system. So we've got to turn a bit of rhetoric into reality. The third theme is encapsulated in the not selected Lib Dem uh, amendment, which is the importance of parity of esteem for vocational qualifications. This is absolutely vital, crucial, seismic. Members can call it what they want. It is what has driven so many of the improved outcomes that have been achieved by young people in recent years. Mr Rennie cited the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework, the development of new qualifications and awards, the recognition of the potential in every young person is central to ensuring our education system lives up to the values of this national discussion of being ambitious, inclusive and supportive. President Officer, in conclusion, um, without wishing to sound like an old man, uh, one of the biggest differences I see in our education system today to when I was in school in the 1970s and 1980s is the focus on ensuring every young person goes on to a good, positive outcome. I received a fantastic state education in that period and went on to a good outcome. It wasn't the case for most of my peers, however. One of the strengths of Scottish education is ensuring every young person gets a positive outcome and that should be central to the national discussion. Thank you. And I call Sue Webber to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP Government has presided over 16 years of failure in Scottish education. With the gap between the poorest and richest pupils widening and education standards dropping, the SNP have starved schools and staff of resources and their curriculum for excellence has been a failure. The publication of uh, All Learners in Scotland Matter, our national discussion on education, is welcome and serves as a resounding call to action for the Scottish Government to prioritise urgent and meaningful reforms. Acknowledging the prevailing frustrations that were mentioned in Stephen Kerr's contribution, the cynicism, the anger stemming from unmet promises of reform in the past, the report instils a sense of doubt regarding the Government's commitment to genuine and lasting change underscoring the necessity for immediate action. This government has fundamentally broken the education system in Scotland and urgent action is required to address these problems. Yes, I shall. John Swinney. Does Sue we I'm grateful to Sue Webber for giving way. Does Sue Webber honestly believe that the statement she's just put on the record is in any shape or form compatible with Liz Smith's intervention to me a few moments ago. Sue Webber. I think sitting and listening to the committee evidence that I hear from people, the attainment gap that we are seeing widening, the evidence we're seeing of that dropping out of regional and national and international statistics does say something, and we need to acknowledge that. And I want to acknowledge that those working and volunteering in the sector now, including parents and carers and young people and teachers, 
they are all ready to embrace change that is needed, the reform that they are seeking. They are ready for significant change. We have heard about the importance of a future Scottish education system which was welcoming and inclusive of all children and young people, including attention to early identification and adequate resources and specialist supporters to enable everyone to learn and flourish. The Scottish Conservatives would encourage the use of digital technology from the earliest stages of school and in all subjects, not just the ones traditionally associated with IT, such as computer science and administration. Our young people want to use technology in their learning, but teachers and PSAs must also be provided with the continuing development opportunities to keep pace with this change. It's rapid in how and what people are learning. We should also deliver a laptop or a device of any sort to every pupil, eradicating a technology divide between rich and poor. One of my constituents is a music teacher and he has raised with me some concerns around various uh, discrepancies within music across Edinburgh. He works in a number of primary schools across the city with the music, Youth Music Initiative. Get my teacher in that. While he acknowledges the additional funding that's been announced for the Youth Music Initiative, he does not believe that it's enough. This goes back to the extracurricular work that Liz Smith was mentioning. We are already seeing a situation across the UK in which most of the young people go on to study music at university are privately educated because they are some of the few people receiving adequate music education. The Scottish Conservatives' New Deal for Teachers would allow more children in this situation to learn music. And linking to music, it's now abundantly clear that the well-being and health of children and young people is one of the most pressing and important issues in Scotland. Without proactively addressing the issue of well-being and mental health, any attempts to improve learners' achievement and attainment levels will be undermined. We know that there's a growing need for more support for children and young people, with most long-term mental health problems beginning in adolescence. 75% of mental illnesses start before a person's 18th birthday. Schools and colleges should be utilised to provide early, preventative mental health support to children and young people across Scotland. Mindfulness is the basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we're doing, and not over overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. Teaching mindfulness and therefore resilience and our young people will help them with the challenges they face now and into the future. The nurturing, supportive environment in our education system must start as soon as possible. It makes our young kids more resilient, as I've said. They can help to understand, through mindfulness, what is normal in terms of feelings. Being anxious and nervous is part of life, but it's when it gets overpowering that support and help is needed. At Curry Primary School, and this was in the report, uh, they, came. they have nurture clubs, a worry box and a de-stress zone and a point in the day for mindfulness, colouring and calm music just to relax. Having a focus on health and well-being and making sure that there is a safe place, a safe space and available staff to support pupils who are struggling is equally important. People need a safe place to go and calm down and somewhere safe to speak when they are upset, overwhelmed or angry. So in conclusion, presiding officer, while we're acknowledging there are many policies, instances of good practice within schools and supportive groups that already focus on this issue, from the conversations with children and young people, it is clear that much more needs to be done. A future education system in Scotland must uphold norms, practices and values right across the system to remove the barriers to learning that young people encounter. The need for change is accepted by all of those taking part in this discussion. So let's be brave. Let's make the wholesale changes that are needed. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Neil Bibby to be followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this important debate. As my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy said, Scottish Labour welcome the government's national discussion on education and the publication of the report, but it must now lead to uh, the right action and positive change. It is essential that the voices of those in the education sector, especially children, parents and teachers, are not only listened to but acted upon. It should also be clear that we want to create an education system that meets the needs of all our children and young people without doing so. 
The sad reality is that pupils who live in more affluent families are still more likely to succeed in school and higher education. And we won't close the poverty-related attainment gap unless we give our teachers and staff the proper resources to do their job. Pam Duncan Gladstone made some important points in this regard about non-contact working time. Resources will also be needed to better support children with additional support needs and to tackle issues such as violence in our schools. It will take the efficient use of resources to make our shared objectives a reality. President officer, a national discussion or vision for education will only be a national success if it delivers positive results for the whole country and particularly places like Renfrewshire in the west of Scotland. And, President Officer, today I want to discuss the major challenges facing children and education staff in Renfrewshire. Renfrewshire children are currently facing a double whammy when it comes to resources. This will make positive change uh, more difficult to achieve rather than easier. Not only are local pupils and staff facing cuts to the attainment challenge funding, they are also facing a massive bill and disruption from the Dargaval schools debacle. President Officer, on attainment challenge funding, Four of the nine authorities that have been allocated th that funding are in my West Scotland region, Inverclyde, Western Bartonshire, North Ayrshire and Renfrewshire. That is a stark reminder of the scale and concentration of poverty in the West of Scotland. But these areas all face massive cuts to their share of attainment challenge funding. For example, in Renfrewshire, it is 71 per cent. So I say to uh, the Government that I do not have a problem with providing extra money for education in every council across Scotland that is badly needed nor with reviewing how existing funding is being used and considering improvements. However, I do have a problem with funding extra money for all councils by taking it from those councils that the Scottish Government itself has identified as facing the biggest challenge with the poverty-related attainment gap. Hitting the poorest families in the poorest areas the hardest will only worsen the attainment gap. Presiding officer, one group of people the Cabinet Secretary for Education should definitely be having an urgent discussion with is the parents of children in Dargaville, Renfrewshire. A primary school was built with a capacity of 430, when in fact accommodation is needed for 1,500 pupils. The former Education Secretary, Shirley Ann Somerville, told me she had not seen anything like it, and I agree. Renfrewshire Council's cut. I will take an intervention, yes. Stephen Kerr. I am grateful for Neil Bibby giving way. Does not this whole episode, though, point to a very a very important issue that lies at the heart of our local democracies. No one seems to be accountable for these things. No one seems to be brought forward to account for what they've done. Does he agree that something needs to be done to change that dynamic in our local democracy? Neil Bibby. I absolutely agree there needs to be a greater accountability and greater accountability on this particular issue. And there needs to be a full and independent investigation by the Accounts Commission, and I'll come on to that shortly. Uh, because Renfrewshire Council's catastrophic failure to accurately estimate school role projections has left children with the joy of learning in porter cabins and Renfrewshire taxpayers facing a massive bill of at least £168 million to fix this mess. This is money that should have been paid for by developers. It should not have cost the public a penny. I am raising this not because this is just a little local difficulty, but because this is a major and scandalous waste of taxpayers' money. It is the equivalent of £2,000 in tax for every Renfrewshire household. It is the equivalent of nearly one of the CalMac ferries that we have discussed many times in this chamber. President officer, the original mistake was bad enough, but the response since by Renfrewshire Council has been woeful too. Parents have now lost confidence in Renfrewshire Council's Chief Executive and Director of Education, and have also called upon Council Leader Neil Nicholson to consider his position. This was not always the case. To be clear, when the debacle was first exposed, the Parents' Council and Dargaville were clear they wanted to work with the Council uh, and to work with them constructively and with, without recrimination to find solutions for the children and parents of Dargaville and also for Renfrewshire as a whole. But after months of trying to work with the Council, they have had to give up. They have cited a lack of urgency in trying to fix the error, a lack of transparency regarding the fiasco and the poor state of planning for the new primary school. They have also rightly questioned the sufficiency of Park Main's extension to cater adequately for the area's secondary school requirements, a sticking plaster approach, as Councillor Gillian de Graham has described it. There needs to be accountability for this debacle and urgent solutions that ensure no child in Renfrewshire is left to pay the price of the Council's incompetence. An external review by the Chief Execs Club Solace 
initiated and paid for by Renfrewshire Council simply will not command public confidence. The Council already appeared to know the review's findings, given press statements declaring that no one senior currently employed at the Council was responsible. There must be a full and independent investigation carried out by the Accounts Commission. The Scottish Government should be demanding this and accountability too. Not only that, they need to step in to ensure their solutions are delivered, including financial support that don't leave other children in Renfrewshire paying the price. Because families are asking how long it will take for other schools that need to get built to get built. They're also asking what other services, including education services, are going to have to be cut to pay for this failure. If families and taxpayers don't have confidence in Renfrewshire Council, then I don't see why the Scottish Government should. Presiding officer, parents in Dargaville want a commitment from the Education Secretary today to have a discussion with them and action to follow from that. There are major obstacles in the way of achieving anything coming out of the national discussion for education in Renfrewshire, and no child should lose out because of the incompetence of their council. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Ben McPherson, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. Today's debate and the national discussion as a whole are an important opportunity for all of us to reflect on where we've been, where we are and where we're going with Scottish education. And as I consider my contribution to this debate in terms of ideas and suggestions reflect on the report, it was interesting the Cabinet Secretary talked about how she launched the report at Tower Bank Primary this morning. And I think about four of my friends who went to Tower Bank Primary. One uh, went on to be a professional athlete and then a journalist. The other, another a successful academic. Another a successful electrician with their own business. And uh, the, the last a uh, successful painter and decorator. All did well. And I think about how the circumstances were then compared with now. And it is undoubtedly clear that Scottish education has improved in that period. There has been more investment. There is more innovation. There is more room for creativity. There is more acceptance and support for those with different abilities. So as we reflect where we are, I think we also need to highlight the positives of what Curriculum for Excellence has achieved. Uh, in terms of successful learners and effective contributors, we know that recent statistics show that there are higher levels of individuals going on to positive destinations at 95.7% in terms of the academic year 21-22. Sure. Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful to Ben McPherson for giving way. Does he agree, though, that we ought to really take the measurement of positive destinations further than just a few months into the post-school life of our school leavers? We ought to be tracking the, the, what happens to these people. Uh, they're so important to the future of our country. Surely we should invest more effort in finding out what becomes of our school leavers. Ben McPherson. I think efforts to improve our statistical analysis should always be under consideration. But there are also aspects of the Curriculum for Excellence that are less measurable. For example, the uh, value that we place on creativity, which uh, I know was a key element in the launch of Curriculum for Excellence and the focus of, of uh, the architects at that time. For example... I heard Brian Boyd say uh, in 2008, uh, when I went to see him at the, the Edinburgh Book Festival, that uh, lots of things uh, are excellent and we need to um, consider the fact that we need to value those different ways of being excellent. We've definitely developed in that regard. We've definitely developed as a country in terms of having more confidence. Young people today are so much more confident than they were when I was growing up. Uh, in terms of a sense of responsibility, there is much greater civic responsibility when it comes to issues around climate change, around how we improve our society, that sense of internationalism that is much more prevalent than it was in decades past. But it's not perfect, and I'm not, I'm not pretending so. And one issue I would like to highlight in the time that I have is uh, the issue of um, violence against women and girls. Uh, Zero Tolerance Scotland highlighted in the contribution of, uh, for today's debate that 64% of girls and young women have experienced sexual harassment at school uh, in, in recent years, uh, a survey done by Girl Guiding. Um, and I would encourage all of us to continue to support initiatives like the White Ribbon Campaign uh, and for us to continue to focus all year round on how we challenge those negative behaviours and improve that situation because it is really concerning. In terms of issues within the report, there are some that I just want to pick up on. Um, digital has been highlighted 
Uh, the RSE made a contribution that uh, as we, uh, as a world, enter the so-called fourth industrial revolution marked by increasingly sophisticated and integrated technologies, the way in which education is delivered could change drastically. Uh, and I think we, we really can't underestimate that in terms of artificial intelligence in particular. Prompt engineering may well become one of the most important skills in a generate AI, AI world. So if there are efforts that need to be made for us to get ahead of the game rather than catching up in terms of IT skills, perhaps that's an area that needs focus. Uh, and that also highlights how important it was uh, that the government took the initiative, particularly during the pandemic, on digital access and inclusion uh, with investment of £48 million to deliver devices to around 60,000 households uh, using uh, and working with organisations like People Know How who were based in my constituency. So uh, how we get ahead on the technological and digital issues is, is absolutely vital. Uh, I also want to highlight the points that were made around breaking down the academic and vocational divide, uh, as is um, highlighted in 4.4 uh, in the summary report. Uh, and one idea that I wondered if we should consider is how do we marry up introducing young people and encouraging them to engage in the arts with how do we improve and enhance their either digital or practical skills. Uh, how we get that balance right, I think, is something that we could uh, potentially finesse. I thought Ross Greer was right to mention the issue of homework. I do have concerns and have done for some time about how homework contributes to the poverty-related attainment gap in that it's much easier for some people to do homework than others and I do think it's an area of concern that we need to continue to consider. Um, along with teacher training, uh, CPD, are there measures that we need to take in that regard? Uh, but overall, uh, uh, there's, this is the start of the next chapter of the conversation. As the Cabinet Secretary highlighted, we now enter a phase of engaging with young people, with engaging with the profession. Um, I'm excited to see how that develops. I encourage us as a parliament as a whole to be solution focused and constructive uh, and I'm excited to see how this is taken forward uh, and support the Cabinet Secretary in her endeavours to do that. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches and I call on Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I would remind those of my declaration of interest as a former employee of East Lothian Council, who I may well mention. Um, in my contribution. Um, it's always a pleasure to follow Ben McPherson, although I find myself saying that more frequently these days in the past, but I do think that he highlights some very important matters that um, have been pointed to in this report, particularly his comments about violence against women and girls and the 64% who've suffered violence and sexual harassment in school. And I think this speaks to the earlier interventions and discussions that we have a cohort of young people who are attending school and are not feeling safe. And that responsibility falls on all of us to ensure it's not the case. Because as all teachers and indeed I think all human beings know, if you cannot fulfill those basic um, elements of food, protection, safety and housing, then to expect our young people to achieve anything else is almost impossible. Um, uh, I will do. Ross Greer. I'm very grateful to Mr Whitfield for taking the intervention. I wonder if he'd agree with me that what's absolutely critical to tackling violence against women and girls in our school is making sure that every young person learns about consent during sex and relationship education, because that is not currently the case, despite aspirations for it to be so. Martin Whitfield. I, I, I thank Ross Greer for that intervention and absolutely agree, because part of growing up is pushing against boundaries that those that surround you explain why they're there. And through empathy and understanding, um, discussion with adults, indeed discussion with um, young people of the same age, of older and, and younger, um, people develop the tools to um, inhabit an adult life safely. And I think we are letting our young people down, not just in respect of consent, but with consent on a lot of these matters, that we are not giving them the experiences that they need to draw on to become the better adults. In, indeed, one of the veritable foundations of the curriculum for ex excellence to be a better contributor and citizen of Scotland. Um, I welcome the um, Cabinet Secretary's int introduction and again the consensus that I think she's striving to make 
um, and achieve across this. And again, to echo Pam Duncan Glancy's comments, we will support the government. Indeed, we will support anyone who has the right solutions to these problems. But they are urgent. They can't wait longer. Our young people are growing up. Indeed, if um, I can be s slightly flippant as to su suggest that if this is the Cabinet Secretary's P1 year, um, this government's actually just finishing university. Um, so there is a period of time that we have to address and there is a shortage of it going forward. I very much welcome her comments about... Um, yes. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful for the member for giving way. What I was going to say in my, to my earlier intervention, although the, we talk about the, the, the uh, children today, one of the concerns I have about our schools today is the rise in ill health, especially in mental health. And that is something, if we don't tackle, will have a huge impact on attainment. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful for that intervention. I think a lot of the contributions today, and indeed the report it's based on, has talked about the multifaceted nature of what a good education system looks like. It's not a simple solution, and it's not the same solution for every young person. But there are essential elements, from the, the touch typing, indeed, that we, we, we discussed earlier, with some level of humour, but with an importance that rests in there, as it's a tool of communication. To outdoor education, to sport, to keeping fit, these are all elements that our young people need to experience. Um, I am conscious of time, and I apologise to those that I don't get a chance to make a mention of, but I did want to raise with the Cabinet Secretary this holistic and coherent approach across government with the publication of the violence prevention framework for Scotland today, where there's a discussion in it from the Scottish Government that says, and I quote, for example, we are committed to incorporating the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children through implementation of getting it right for every child. Um, and I would ask that that does not mean that we've abandoned the idea of bringing the bill back and placing it on the statute book here. Um, and again, it, with a holistic and coherent approach across government, it would be good to see um, joined up language so that we don't end up with questions being raised that are unnecessary. Um, there have been some very positive um, contributions today um, and I think a lot of them have picked up a number of um, important aspects. I'd like to point to Ruth Maguire um, and her comments on the National Youth Link Strategy and the joyfulness of learning um, that she picked out because we do need to recognise um, not necessarily qualifications, but experiences out with school that need to be reflected and that young people very proudly bring into school, bring into their lives. And schools should be places where that joy can be um, shared. Um, I will. The member is in his final minute. Very quickly, um, I just wondered, we haven't spent a great deal of time on further education and I think it's quite key to going forward um, and some of the aspects that we've spoken about. So it's just to put on record, can we have a commitment around that? Martin Whitfield. Uh, absolutely. And it's right to say that education should be lifelong. And in fact, there's been much mention of the different areas of education throughout. We have concentrated to some extent the contributions on primary schools, but also on high schools, the reform of um, the assessment situation. I am conscious of the lateness of time. It's disappointing because I would have liked to have mentioned Liz Smith and Ross Greer's contributions and others. But let me finish, since I gave the declaration of interest, about Preston Lodge, a high school in Preston Pans, who for many years has had as its aims and values achievement, respect, learning, community, but above all, happiness. Because if our children can be happy in school, they can be confident. And if they can be confident, they can learn. And if they can learn, then they can contribute. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I feel that parliamentarians have been somewhat spoiled over the last two weeks with not one, but two debates on education. That's two opportunities for this government to defend its record on their handling of our education system but two opportunities for the Scottish Conservatives to promote new, bold and ambitious ideas to restore Scotland's education system to its once-renowned world-class status. However, I do think it is a shame and a missed opportunity for the Scottish Government as they have backed themselves into their usual corner of denying accountability for the mess that they have presided over for the last 16 years. They have previously shown a lack of willingness to fight to improve education standards and learning outcomes for our young people, have yet to announce any bold or new ambitious policies, 
and have rightly been challenged by members on this side of the chamber and other opposition members during today's debate. The Scottish Conservatives made our position clear again today. The SNP are presiding over an education system in desperate need of repair. I certainly will. Ben McPherson. I, I was just wondering if Megan Gallagher was going to talk about the ideas and the solutions and the proposals rather than just criticising as the Conservatives see it, the government. I, I think that would take us into a better space. Megan Gallagher. I will just get on to that point, Mr McPherson, but I think we need to also, um, also look at the story as to how we got here and why we're having a national discussion on our education system. So let's get to this point. Members from across the chamber have examined the publication of All Learners in Scotland, um, our national discussion on education. It was an interesting read, but my worry is that it will be another report that will gather dust at the back of a shelf in a government office because this has happened before. In 2017, the Scottish Government announced a new education bill, which was subsequently dropped and has not been spoken of since. So I really do hope that history will not repeat itself. Yeah, yeah. After all, the Scottish Government has had plenty of opportunities to bring in substantial changes that would improve outcomes for our young people, to give our young people the best possible start in life, because they have been let down at every turn. And I did have a chuckle to myself when the, the government referenced COSLA and their motion as a solution to turn this vision into a reality for Scotland's children and young people. Because the SNP have stripped local authorities of powers and made them penniless. So how do they intend to reform education when they don't have the right infrastructure, finance and resource in place? And that was a point also raised by Neil Bibby. I will, yes. John Swinney. I'm grateful to Megan Gallagher for, for giving way. I wonder if she'd like to tell Parliament how much more money the Conservatives would have given to local authorities in the budget propositions they put to the Finance Minister for the current year's budget. Megan Gallagher. I think a better question for Mr Swinney would be why, when he was in government, did the SNP squander so much money that could have been put into educational resources? Presiding officer, if I may pick up on a couple of the themes that were debated today. Firstly, additional support needs. ASM provision is failing in many council areas, including my own within North Lanarkshire. Children are being placed within the wrong learning environment that is undoubtedly having a detrimental impact on young people who need more support. Stephen Kerr was spot on. It is time we address this. And then there were issues highlighted within the report directly. Job insecurity, exhaustion and the stress that teachers face on a daily basis. Violence and bullying in our schools, an issue that we debated only last week. And classroom sizes, which must be one of the biggest missed opportunities of the SNP's time in government. Why have they not achieved this goal, given that it was a manifesto promise in 2007? And of course, extracurricular learning. Liz Smith raised the importance of extracurricular learning that is vital to the de development of a young person, both mentally and socially. That's why I'm backing her member's bill, and I hope MSPs across this chamber will too. And mindfulness, as mentioned by Sue Weber, having a focus on health and well-being in the classroom is crucial, given the modern-day pressures placed on our young people. And the last theme that I wish to mention, and it would be remiss of me not to, is touch typing. Although Stephen Kerr's intervention stole my thunder, as the Scottish Conservatives have adopted touch typing as part of our skills policy, and I am pleased that Fergus Ewing welcomes this decision. Presiding officer, I will make no apologies when I say that the SNP have yet to make any real improvements to our education system. Teachers deserve better, teaching staff deserve better, pupils deserve better. I welcome the opportunity to have a national discussion about education. In fact, it is long overdue. But unless it improves the learning outcomes or closes the attainment gap, it will all have been for nothing. Listening to the debate today, it is the Scottish Conservatives that have the ambition to bring something new and exciting to Scotland's education system. There would be no more talking about change if we were in charge. Change would already be happening. But for now, we will encourage this government to do better to give our head teachers more powers over their schools, to deliver a new deal for teachers, to establish a national college and to introduce life skills as part of the core curriculum. That's the ambitious vision that our young people and teachers deserve. That's the vision that the Scottish Conservatives will continue to promote. Presiding officer, I think we have had enough education reports to last us a lifetime. No more dithering, no more delays. 
We need action from this SNP Government now. Everyone who has contributed to the Let's Talk Education national discussion will expect nothing less. Whether the Government is up to this task, Presiding Officer, time will definitely tell. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Jenny Gilruth to wind up. Up to nine minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I, I want to start on a, a note of consensus. Uh, Stephen Kerr said that he is proud of Scotland for the record engagement that we had through the national discussion. People care in Scotland about our education system, and I think we can all agree on that today. Pam Duncan Glancy spoke about the hunger for change in her contribution, and I agree. I think we heard some of that from Megan Gallagher, although I would not agree with the substantive contribution she made. But more broadly, there is a hunger for change, I think, in the education system at the current time. Now, as I think I outlined in my opening remarks, presiding officer, the government will accept the Labour amendment tonight. Um, evidence, of course, tells us that looking to increase non-contact time can help to improve learning and teaching. That's really important, I think. So we will work with the Scottish Negotiating Committee for Teachers. Um, I give Parliament that undertaking today that we will work with the SNCT on that as an important uh, focus for the government in taking that action forward. Happy to do so. Pam Duncan Clancy. Secretary, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention and I welcome and thank the, the, the Government for supporting our, our amendment today. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out a timescale for when they will be able to fulfil that commitment? Cabinet Secretary. I am not able to give her one at the current time but I am more than happy to write to her before the end of this session to give her an update in relation to the timescales. In relation to Mr Rennie's contribution, Will Rennie spoke, of course, about mainstreaming. He said he is in favour of mainstreaming, and I very much um, agree. I think he gave an example from his own constituent. Um, and uh, in all honesty, it, it sounded a familiar one to me as a, a former classroom teacher, because teachers have always had to adapt to meet the needs of their pupils in classrooms. That's part of the job of being a teacher. And I suppose the approach to the implementation of Morgan has really been about a partnership approach between Scottish Government and local authorities who fundamentally are responsible for delivering education in our schools. We know we had a, a progress update in October 22, but I do accept there's more we will need to do in that regard, particularly in relation to the increase of numbers in relation to people who have identified additional support needs. Uh, Christine Graham spoke about the, the numbers of staffing to that point for additional support needs, and she gave examples from her own teaching career. And again, I could identify with some of those examples and how you adapt as a classroom teacher. And I think we all need to be mindful that teachers are skilled experts in what they do. They adapt to the class in front of them and they tailor the lesson to the needs of their children and young people in front of them too. I'm more than happy to do so. Willie Rennie. It was actually a quote from the National Discussion uh, Report rather than my constituency, but it is something that's familiar. And I accept her point that teachers are skilled, but this is pretty overwhelming. And I think the government do, does need to understand that it's almost impossible in some occasions when there are so many people with such a variety of needs in the one class. Does she accept that? Cabinet Secretary. I, I do accept that, but I think we also need to reflect the reality that we do currently have the highest recorded level of support staff and additional support needs on record in our schools. Now, that is directly a result of the government providing an additional £15 million per year to help support those additional staff in our schools. But I do accept the, the wider point that there is more we will need to look at, yes, through the Morgan Review, but also more broadly through the outputs of the national discussion. And I think, too, from Hayward, to ensure that we are providing that support to more challenging instances in relation to additional support needs, but also, as we heard in the Chamber last week, changes in relation to behaviour and relationships and how that plays out in our classrooms. Happy to do so. For that. I'm grateful to uh, Jenny Ruth for giving way. But, but to be absolutely clear, uh, despite what she's just said, the national discussion responses, and I'll quote, it's in 5.2.13, the national discussion were clear that there were currently insufficient appropriate resources, mm -hmm. including staffing and specialists, yeah. to fully support all children and young people's individual needs. The reality is that while the level of additional support needs has risen to a third. The proportion of resources being expended to support classroom teachers with those diverse needs, that's not been delivered by this government, has it? Cabinet Secretary. I'm afraid I would uh, disagree with some of what Mr Kerr has said. I recognise the critique he puts to me from the report, and of course the government will come to respond to the report in due course. 
But it is also worth saying that the government is spending a record high this year alone on additional support needs, so £830 million in 2021 22 Forgive me, last year, presiding officer. We are putting a significant amount of public money into supporting these children and young people in our education system. And I asked Mr Kerr and the Conservative Party if they would like us to spend more money from where in the Scottish Government's budget should we take that money. Now, presiding officer, Ross Greer spoke about the openness... Ross Rio spoke about the openness of the approach adopted by the facilitators and the lessons I think we can learn as we move forward with our reform agenda. And uh, I think we heard from Liz Smith and from Willie Rennie too about the reform agenda. And of course, I'll be coming to Parliament uh, in a few weeks' time to give an update to that end. He talked about more challenge and the narrative privilege, and I wholeheartedly agree, having worked for two of the organisations, I think he quoted in his contribution. It's hugely important that we have a, a wider reach in terms of where we go on reform, that we don't just hear from the same old voices in Scottish education. And I think this report has actually been really successful to that extent, to managing to get into local communities, but to speak to children and young people about their views too. He spoke about, and I think Liz Smith spoke about this too, about uh, levels of cynicism potentially around about the reform agenda. And I think how the teaching profession is engaged in the outputs of the Hayward Review, particularly, of course, in the secondary sector, will be key to that end. I think that was a response I gave to Pam Duncan Glancy earlier. They need to be fundamentally, presiding officer, part of what comes next. We cannot do it without them. And whether or not that's a diploma approach, whether or not that's an IB approach, I think we heard from, from Liz Smith. I haven't received yet the final report, of course, from Professor Hayward. All of that should be up for debate, but we need to engage directly with the profession who as we heard last week in the debate in the chamber, have been through quite a tough time, I think it's fair to say, in recent uh, years. It has to also be joined up, and I think we heard from Mr Rennie about the interconnectivity in relation to assessment between higher education and what happens in our senior phase. And I think, forgive me, it was Ross Greer who touched on uh, approaches to continuous assessment, and I declare an interest as being married to a lecturer. The different approaches that are now used in the higher education sector are night and day from when I was at university 20-odd years ago. And I think it's hugely important that actually our school sector could learn from some of those differing approaches which better support our children and young people fundamentally to attain their potential. It was uh, good to hear this afternoon from John Swinney and he spoke of course of the strengths in Scottish education. Um, he gave three substantive points, one of course being in relation to poverty and how that is an inhibitor to children and young people reaching their potential. And I know from personal experience exactly what Mr Swinney means when he says that. That's why, of course, the government has a programme tackling poverty in our schools. But there are a number of outside influences that the report actually acknowledges, particularly in relation, for example, to the cost of living crisis, that are also impacting on our children's attainment in our schools. And the government in Scotland is limited to an extent in what we can do to respond to that That's notwithstanding. Fantastic. He also spoke about supporting the profession and about the role of local government in that regard. And I think it's an interesting point he makes, and I'm keen to take that forward with COSLA. And on parity of esteem. And that, too, is hugely important with the outputs of the Hayward Review, but also, presiding officer, with the outputs from the Withers Review, which will look at the skills landscape. And I think it's hugely important we don't narrowly look at the senior phase in isolation, that we look more broadly at skills delivery, particularly in our schools, who are really good at finding out the best pathways for their young people. Uh, Sue Webber spoke about uh, digital provision. She will know, of course, that the government provided substantial finance in 2020-21 to delivering 72,000 devices. And we're also working with local government to roll that out further too. We know that about 55% of learners may already have access to a device, but it's fair to say that we will need to go further. And I recognise that point, particularly in relation to the outputs from the report itself. Neil Bibby has raised an important local issue in relation to school provision in Renfrewshire and Dargaville, and I give him a, an undertaking that I will meet with him and the parents affected. I know that he has written to me, I think, on this very matter and met previously with the, the Cabinet Secretary on this issue. And finally, presiding officer, I give a commitment to Ruth Maguire that we are continuing to engage with stakeholders um, on the outputs of the uh, youth strategy. And I think it's really important that that youth work strategy ties up with the broader approach we've seen from the national discussion today. Presiding officer, I'm conscious of time, but today really has been an opportunity to seize the optimism highlighted in the national discussion. There is an eagerness in the teaching profession, an eagerness from parents and carers, and fundamentally, a need for all of us to ensure that our education reform agenda delivers for our young people. And I say to Parliament today that this national discussion provides us with that foundation for the agenda to move forward. But 
We all have an obligation to engage in that agenda in good faith. So I commend the national discussion to Parliament today and I commit to work with all parties on delivering a Scotland in which every learner does matter. Presiding officer. Thank you.